Hi guys, welcome and welcome back to the podcast. I've been meaning to watch that. I'm your host Monica and we are back again with a new week, new topic, and new guests I could do every single week. And this week I have a very special guest with us today. This is someone that I came across on my For You page on TikTok and she is someone who is very insightful, very smart, very funny. I really did enjoy watching her like rewatch um, Avatar from the beginning to the end and then start watching Korra and then tuning into all her other videos I saw that she has some really awesome takes about movies and tv shows and I thought that this girl is a wonderful wonderful person to have on the podcast so guys she is Maria watches everything on tiktok you can follow her because her link is in the description down below but I'd like for everyone to say hi to Maria hi, hi everyone Oh, thank you so much for all those kind words. That was so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you deserve them. Yeah. I love watching your videos. And every time you come yeah. up on my For You page now, I'm just like, oh my gosh, absolutely yeah. yes. I, I know I went really hard on the Avatar content. So it's like, <laughs> you know, I, don't, I think I made 200 videos. So I'm just like, oh, thank God people watch them. Yay. Yeah, I'm going to be yeah. honest. I'm probably the only person who hasn't watched Avatar. And seeing your videos is like, Every time I saw one of your videos about Avatar, I was just thinking in my head, like, I have to start watching the show. That way I know what yeah. she's talking about. And I'll be honest with you. This was, I watched it for the first time in my adult, like, ever mm-hmm. as an adult for the first time. And that's when, and I was just like, I'm so mad at myself for not watching Suitors. So many people have told me to watch the show for, like, years now. Mm-hmm. So when I watched it, I'm like, this is my new favorite show. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it. and I will say that, like, even as an adult, I know it was a kid's show, but as an adult, definitely watch it. Like, there is no age when it comes to Korra and Avatar. Like, you mm-hmm. gotta watch it. So, I'm really happy that, like, it's, like, inspiring you to watch it as well. Yeah. Honestly, I'm the same way where I didn't watch it when I was young. And the thing is, when Avatar was on air, it was on air, like, you know, episode by episode. And mm-hmm. I was just like, I don't want to start watching it now and not know mm-hmm. what's going on. But then it got on Netflix, and I still wasn't, like... I don't know, hungry to watch it, but I am getting back into anime now. Um, yeah. At, at the big age of 26. So maybe I'll finally watch Avatar. Yeah. No, there's. I feel like anime is one of those things that like you can watch at any age, which is like what I love about anime the most, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely mm-hmm. so. So I'm very excited to have you on because we aren't talking about Avatar. Sorry to listeners who thought <laughs> you were going <laughs> to get an Avatar. always talk about Avatar, though. So. <laughs> one day. <laughs> Maybe one day. But today we're talking about Tubi's newest show, Big Mood, which stars Nicola Coughlin and Lydia West. And it is a Channel 4 sitcom that was then, like, picked up by Tubi. And... Are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, yeah. just making sure. <laughs> yeah, and the thing I love about this show is just... First of all, I love this on Tubi, so it's free. But mm-hmm. there's so much about the show that makes it so special and funny and kind of like endearing to me. But mm-hmm. before we get into that, we're going to jump into our first segment, which is Media Mania, where we talk about, you know, new releases, entertainment news and the like. And there have been a lot of new releases. Um, but around the time yeah. that we're recording this, we'll have a lot of new releases like Fall Guy, Furiosa, Taro is a new movie that's also coming out. Um, Boy Kills World is another new film coming out. Challengers. Challengers, yes. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, it's already out, but it is like a new release. So Yeah, for sure. Um, it came out, well, when it comes out. I think it comes out the same week, well, like around the same time as Boy Kills World. So, mm-hmm. yeah. It's, um, it's a solid uh, lineup for new films in May. Yeah, May is a good month, and we, I think we had talked about before, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, um, TV shows-wise, too, like, we have um, maybe Interview with a Vampire coming out around mm-hmm. this time, mm-hmm. uh, so May is a good month, I'm very excited about May. <laughs> I cannot wait for Interview with a Vampire to come out, because I love that show, and it is, like, so chaotic, and just, like, overwhelming. I would- so I would say it was like the best show I watched last mm-hmm. year, like season one. Um, like the the TV was great last year, um, and I haven't understand the Emmys had to go to Succession because of Succession. But Interview with a Vampire was easily hands down one of the best shows that came out. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I feel like 
it's one of the only adaptations it's one of the very few adaptations of reboots that have come out where it takes like the same story and kind of introduces it in a new light but it's still mm-hmm. so good yeah yeah i never read the book and i really want to because of the series i watched the movie and i love the movie um but the movie left me wanting and i feel like the series gives me exactly that like i love vampire stuff and i love horror and i think the movie did a good job with it but like this show like it does a great job with vampire horror romance like mm-hmm. i don't know like it's just it's just so good i don't even know I mean, that's a whole other episode too but just it has all the elements perfectly down packed because it's scary and terrifying but at the same time you're like so enamored mm-hmm. by the character and i'm just like i just want to keep watching because this is kind of hot <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, honestly, if you're somebody who likes to be scared and that turns you on, I feel like you'll like Interview with oh, the Vampire. That is like exactly it. Like if that's to the T, Interview with a Vampire. Yeah. Seeing mm-hmm. Challengers come out and Interview with a Vampire be released and then like before, prior to that was Love Lies Bleeding. I feel like yeah, there are so example. many like things coming out now with like you can be horny on Maine now. It's not a bad thing. We yeah, exactly. It. And I'm glad we're like recognizing that thriller can be horny. Like yes. it can, it's just like a line to it, but like it can be, you can walk it very well. So yeah, absolutely. The suspension kind of like adds to it. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was like an aesthetic in the 80s that like was really well thrived. And I'm really glad that we're bringing it back now. Oh, yeah. I love that too. And yeah. there are a lot of new releases coming out. I'm really excited. Um, mm-hmm. Something, something else that was due that came out this week was an interview that i believe it was variety i'll have to double check but variety did an interview with um amy schumer you know oh. everyone's oh. everyone's <laughs> favorite female comedian and yeah. she was basically talking about how she is used to the backlash like she doesn't even care anymore you know like to her it's fine and she basically recra- recounts a lot of her um, past like films that have come out that she's pr- proud of and not proud of. And then she starts talking about o- October 7th and how she was scrutinized for posts that she had made um, seemingly mm-hmm. to conflate Palestinians with Hamas. And she also criticized for sharing a video of Martin Luther King condemning anti-Semitism saying Israel's right to exist, even though Bernice King, who is the activist's daughter, responded to her post saying that he would certainly call for Israel's bombing of Palestinians to, Palestinians to cease. And she's basically just, like, complaining. Even I'm assuming because in- there are new movies coming out. Like, she, uh, it's with Jerry Seinfeld. She's in a Jerry that Seinfeld what? movie? Yeah, it's on Netflix. I'm assuming that's why she's in the news again because I saw I saw a poster of it on my Netflix account whenever I like signed in. So I'm assuming that's why she's in the news again. And she was on a tour recently, right? Like a comedy tour. I don't know yeah. how she keeps staying relevant. That's why I was just like, I'm assuming it's because of something is coming out. That's why people keep interviewing her. But yeah, no, I have a lot of thoughts about Amy Schumer. But, uh, I mean, I'm trying to keep the podcast fun and light. So. I mean, you can say your thoughts because honestly, I'm not a huge Amy Schumer fan. Um, okay. There, there are many reasons why people don't like her. Like they don't find her funny. They don't like the joke stealing. They don't like some of the jokes she makes because you know they're sometimes offensive and racist. She has a whole mm-hmm. movie with Goldie Hawn that I personally find to be racist, and I find that a oh, lot yeah. of her. Yeah. Yeah, I find that like a lot of her humor and a lot of the work that she does just doesn't hit the mark that a lot of people think it does. And mm-hmm. I just find her to be really annoying and really irritating and just like a less funny, less smart, but somehow more popular Chelsea Handler, you know? That's a really good ex- explanation for it. Because like, I, like for example, like Jenny Slate is someone who I think is a, like a better comedian. Um, mm-hmm. There's actually there's so many better female comedians. Yeah. But um. Not to get into female comedy, in general, I feel like comedy is a weird space right now because a lot of comedians feel like, oh, we can't say anything anymore without Mm -hmm. getting backlash. When it comes to Amy Schumer, like, I think she's like the Taylor Swift of comedy, like, where she's just like, if things, if people, like, have anything against her, 
who will say like, oh, you're anti-woman. You're like not a feminist. And it's like, no, maybe you do just steal jokes. Maybe you just are funny, you know? I don't think that Amy Schumer is Taylor Swift because at least Taylor Swift has talent. Fair. That's fair. That's all. Because I am a Swift. Low-key, I am a Swifty. I will admit that. <laughs> like, <laughs> she, because she does have poetry. I think her fans and like, it's what her fans say about her and Amy Schumer like says it's about herself. That would say would be equivalent. Okay. I'm going to be honest because I've never really seen any kind of like public love for Amy Schumer, despite the fact that she keeps getting like, I, she keeps getting booked for things. She keeps getting like casted in things. And I honestly am surprised. And I know that like casting directors probably don't care about like the general public's opinion for the most part, because you could just chalk it up to misogyny. That's fine. But there are plenty of valid reasons to not like her. And for her to now like be openly Zionist is like yeah. a very valid reason to not like her. But I think mm-hmm. the one thing that like, pissed me off was how jennifer lawrence like came to her aid and like kind of came oh, to her side yeah yeah she okay. did uh, yeah so and i just want to say like i'm very in so i'm not into taylor swift i'm very anti to amy schwimmer because it's not just that she's a zionist it's that she like she, not only was she anti-zionist but she also went islamophobic and xenophobic in the process of it you know what I mean? Like, she just took it so many steps further. Like, I think the post is down now, but she, like, straight up posted something that was just, like, calling um, Muslims and Arabs, like, the R word. And by R word, I mean, yeah. I'm sure everyone can assume. And I, she still gets booked and busy, whereas, like, Melissa Barrera yeah. puts one thing about genocide. And, like, now she's not even the Scream franchise. Whenever she literally was the face of the Scream franchise. And I think that's what kind of bugs me about care. Like, it's like the no schnapp of it all. Like, there's a man saying Zionism is sexy, but now he's still the face of Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. And Amy Schumer being like, I'm so scared. I'm so worried. And it's like, but you were booked and busy. What do you mean you're so scared and worried? So, like, for me, I feel like she's, like, such an example of, like, how every how she's so protected. Her, like, privilege protects her constantly. Mm-hmm. Um while she gets to be openly like xenophobic islamophobic zionist and denying genocide yeah she doesn't really face any consequences for like her actions Mm -hmm. or what she says so she doesn't really feel the need to rethink anything or she doesn't have a desire to change she never apologized for like i I don't know if she took the post down i think she took the post down i don't think the article probably had her apologizing but like she's never apologize or even try at least like no shop tried to apologize she never she like stood 10 toes down for everything she said yeah and noah's apology was um obviously something he was like forced to do so that people oh, yeah. would like at least like they could give some reconciliation to fans that were like waiting for the half-assed apology that way they could feel good about watching the last season of stranger things and for other people it was just like okay and what does this do what does it have to do with me oh and, and the thing is like because netflix has such a it's it's such a strange things is such a juggernaut of like mm-hmm. money or netflix that you know it's only because of that it's only because like they're really banking on everyone watching the fact that what is it season four of strange things is coming out soon part two five, five maybe yeah okay there we go five so it's I like know. I don't know. As I, I, I used to be a Stranger Things fan, but mm-hmm. like now I'm like, no, I don't give it. Like I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Like I'll like you know like I will watch some other thing. But like it's just it was, it's honestly just kind of like embarrassing for him that like they're literally banking on everyone watching this show, but they're like, ew, no, you have a Zionist. Like why would you? We were not gonna watch it. So like that's the only reason he apologized is because then Netflix started freaking out that no one's gonna watch the show. Which yeah, of course we're not. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that one thing that I've noticed is that obviously the tide is turning in favor of Palestine, so there will be a lot of um, like celebrities who have spoken out in support of Israel mm-hmm. who are either going to double down or they're going to like like run it back. You know, they're going to yeah. like try and hit the Una reverse card. And I just want to <laughs> say that, yeah, like the North doesn't forget, you know, like... Exactly. 
for instance, I saw a movie trailer for a film that is directed by Zoe Kravitz, and it stars uh, Channing Tatum. I don't remember the name of the movie, but it oh, looks yeah, like, for this movie, yeah. yeah, it's giving very much like it's clearly inspired by like Triangle of Sadness, White Lotus, Knives Out. Like it's very much like two hot girls going on a private island with a billionaire and his friends, and then like oh, everybody coming back to me, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, coming back to me. Okay, I totally forgot she was um directing it. Yeah, yeah. okay. And I was looking at the, I was watching the trailer and I was like, you know, I don't really care for this movie, if I'm being honest, because as much as I love Alia um, Shawat, I think it's her name, and Naomi oh, yeah, Aneke, she's in it. Yeah, yeah, she's from uh, Search Party. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think she signed the letter to Biden for ceasefire, so. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. do... I do want to say, like, as much as I think they're both wonderful actresses, I'm not watching that movie because I didn't forget the fact that Zoe Kravitz dated Jaden Smith when he was like 14 years old and she was like 24. I can I could just bootleg the movie because it's not one oh. that needs to be watched in theaters. And let's not forget that Zoe Kravitz like out of turn spoke about like the Will Smith Oscar situation. Like she she went out of her way to be like I feel unsafe. And so did Amy Schumer. Just say. <laughs> Yeah, I find it irritating, like women in Hollywood mm-hmm. that use like feminists as kind of like their brand, and they love taking like the girl and, boss route. But they're and that's the only reason why I brought up Taylor Swift because like that's unfortunately her brand too. Like as mm-hmm. someone who, like I do love her music, it got me through a lot of heartbreaks. But like, unfortunately, I just don't like her brand, and she does have the talent to like back it up. But like, unfortunately her brand is not it anymore Mm -hmm. because she refuses to acknowledge like what it she she refuses to acknowledge the power that she has like you cannot just go to a rami yusuf comedy special that is not enough like do something more with your like privilege essentially yeah that does seem like very minimal in terms of things you can do because of course like going to like a small comedian no Rami Yusuf isn't small but like going to like you know a comedian's comedy special someone who's known for speaking out about Palestine in order to get people interested is such a roundabout way of doing it when you could just share something to your story speak out send out a tweet like just yeah. showing up somewhere as Taylor Swift because it's such a marvel that she would leave her home, is still in a way centering yourself as something that's meant to be like seen as a good thing. And it's, yeah. girl, like, what and, are we doing? Yeah, and it, it, I think and you might have seen my videos about this, but it really bugged me because I'm just like, Rami Yusuf is the one that is donating his money to Palestine. Why is Taylor Swift getting the credit for this? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just when she never says something publicly. So like, this is the frustrating part, again, I love her. <laughs> I do listen to her albums. I think she's very talented. It's just like when it comes to unfortunately centering her as like this pillar of feminism, and then so and then like Amy Schumer also putting herself as like this voice in feminism. Also, Amy Schumer is probably very. I think it came out that she was being sponsored by the IDF at one point too, right? Something like that. Um, it's just like I feel like she thinks. I think she thinks she is the Taylor Swift of this like topic not saying that she is um but no um i'm very 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 what gets me the most about amy Schumer is the fact that she's continuing to sing book and busy whenever she said some terrible things when like literally we're watching people who are pro-palestine um lose their jobs lose their careers even nicola coughlin we've who we're going to be talking about um was threatened that she cannot get more projects if she continues to speak about palestine and um she was just like well f that and like i'm low-key worried about her i know that she's like literally the face of season three of bridgerton but like after this i wonder what's going to happen because like i mean this threat seemed very like you know very serious yeah i do see what you're saying and i agree with you on that um i feel like with nicola she um may possibly be fine if i'm being honest like if it's not yeah, if it's not something, it's not if it's not like an American production, then I'm sure she will get something in the UK or internationally. Mm-hmm. And like I said, be- yeah, like I said before, I feel like the tides are turning in favor of Palestine right now, and mm-hmm. I'm sure it goes without saying that oftentimes being like politically 
um, outspoken and active in the Hollywood industry in a way where it's like you're actually doing something you're not just kind of like doing it as a performance it can lead to results that limit your opportunities and limit your jobs but overall I am glad that Nicola Coughlin exists and I'm just so done with Amy Schumer and I wish she would just like fuck off somewhere in the <laughs> yeah. nicest way possible no yeah whenever he said like the interview with her I'm like why 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 are we still interviewing her <laughs> it's funny because even in the interview like they correct her you know, she says in an interview, it's gone to this place where you can't speak up for other Jews without people feeling like it's a slight to the conditions in Gaza. And then the the article writes, she's referring to the 32,000 plus Gazans killed since October 7th massacre and the million on the verge of starvation. Like the article, the person who wrote the article is like, girl, that's a cute statement how yeah when you look at the facts they 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 did the research which is i'm like i very much agree with you with the sense that like the tides have been turning like it's people like i don't want to say social media but unfortunately like social media has been like the only real honest and like news when it comes to everything that's been going on abroad um yeah I've been seeing like the most random influencers even being like, my bad, I should have been talking about it sooner. And it's like, wow. So it's just, I um, I, I do think the tides are turning. Um, and I do think there's, I, I do think there's hope. It's just like, when you hear about Amy Schumer, you think about like, I, I think that like, it's just the process of it all. It's like, she has been actively against understanding the Palestinian struggle since like, October, like we, again, and I want to emphasize that like the stuff that's been going on in Palestine has been happening for decades, mm -hmm. if not at least eighty years, maybe right. seventy-five years to be exact, right? So it's just like I, I don't know, I, I, whenever I hear that she's still like booked and busy, like you know, her new movie coming out, I'm just like, I do think there is a turn, I, especially with the encampment, especially with all of the whole United States changing. Um, well, the emphasis on like the young population of like what they're doing, how they're being active, how people are not going to vote for Biden, let's be honest. Um, Netanyahu coming in and addressing the college students of America, which is like, why is another country's president talking to us, you know? Anyways, um, but it's just like, why are you so booked and busy? Why why is she still like talking? It's, it's just like my thing. It's, and that's like a problem with the industry. Then there's a lot of corruption with the industry that we saw with just these strikes beforehand, like with AI. And like, I think that's, I speak, I think it speaks onto a bigger problem of oppression in general and how like artists are not, the right artists are not ever like, you know, actually seen and addressed. Yeah. If you do not side with the establishment and like how they view things, then you are on the outskirts. And it's not until they can on a basic surface level agree with what you say you're saying but cannot go any deeper into like the theory or the practice of it all mm -hmm. just why it was yeah. like 2020 when black lives matter was happening and then we learned mm -hmm. about brianna taylor um a lot of in george floyd you know there were a lot of people that were like excited to go on marches and post their black square and show their support yeah. but when all this mm -hmm. was happening in ferguson there was not this much like support behind the movement so it's not until it could be like understand and like brought into like the cultural conversation but then be commercialized and something that they can kind of like understand on a basic level and never go deeper than that kind of like general thought of like oh yeah black people shouldn't be killed in the street police brutality is like bad i think yeah, yeah. it's like babe yeah that is <laughs> right but there are also things we have to talk about like you know homelessness you know income inequality um the fact that there are many like homosexual young teens like living out on the streets and like all these other things you can bring up that are also like reflected with well that, so yeah mm -hmm. and that's all rooted in the black lives matter movement and in the thought that the black lives matter movement is spawned out of but I don't know. The head of Pepsi doesn't know that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just not. <laughs> you were telling me that Kendall Jenner did not know that whenever she did the Pepsi commercial. God. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, jokes aside, though, but like, this is why they keep saying, like, until we're, 
we are not free until Palestine's free. It's just like kind of all of these movements are all associated with each other. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, it's like when you recognize the fact that like colonization is like the root of all the problems and like the Black Lives Matter movement and like the cops, it's just like, it's just how terrible our judicial system is and how basically prisons are basically like modern day slavery when you think about it. And it's just like, and the police system is basically just like continuing to like have that in like the judicial system. But no one wants to talk about that. And the fact that TikTok is being banned instead of like, you know, something like our tax dollars not going to Israel. And there's the homelessness at the most, at the all time high. There's literally, don't even get me started about the gun violence of it all, because that is just like the most heartbreaking of it all. And yet they think this is how they're going to save us is through social media apps. Sorry, I'm like digressing. But the point is, it's all rooted in the same thing. Mm-hmm. And it's just the fact that I just want to colonization continues to like deplete what we actually need and divide us and keep us down. When we recognize that it's all these systems are rooted in trying to control us. And that's why when we break things or we try to fight it, we're the bad guys. Mm-hmm. The narrative is just but that's the only way. This is the only way that we can get through to change. Yeah. I mean, you are right because you can't deny the link that IDF has with Black Lives Matter because mm-hmm. IDF trained a lot of um, American police systems, police forces like the NYPD and also the APD, which is why they're building a cop city in Atlanta because they want to turn mm-hmm. Atlanta into Little Gaza. And it's very scary to see these things coming into fruition and to see people have a purposeful blind eye and intentionally ignore the fact that this is going to hurt like everyday Americans, you know? And like the purpose of blind eye is so real because it's like, what do you make, what makes you think that they wouldn't do it to us? What makes you think that they would? And I guess it's because they come from the privilege of like not being the white people. So they don't think about the same, but like, being like someone that is like a person of color being a black person here like we can see the fact that they could easily do this to us and they could turn their head and do this at any moment because they have in the past so and then you just sound like a conspiracy theorist when you say it to people right. and you're like they're like right? i mean is it really that deep and I'm like it is that deep they don't want you to think yeah. it's that deep because if you say if you turn a blind eye to it then they can do the shit that they want to do and ruin your life you know and it's so exhausting because it's just like unless you get it you don't get it you know yeah and you know you think that your favorite celebrity supporting um israel or the idf is just something that's like oh well that's just her opinion like some opinions are opinions and some opinions are bought and if they're buying people with influential voices to say these things and influence the masses then you need to open your eyes to see what's going on like i'm not saying that there are lizard people living in the basement of a pizza hut yeah. what i'm saying is that there is a very clear and like scholarly explanation for a lot of things we're talking about but you don't want to look at it too hard because it hurts your brain or it makes you uncomfortable and like babe and- how long can we be uncomfortable until everything's fucked you know like and- we're just asking for you to recognize propaganda. Yeah. Like, it, it's propaganda for a reason. It works for a reason. It is important for us to, like, stop and be like, wait, is this, you know, like, I mean, any of us are susceptible to propaganda. That's why it's so terrifying, because it is done so well that it's seeped into every part of our lives. Mm-hmm. So I, I was, like, talking to a friend about this the other day, about, like, a simple thing is like military propaganda. Like it's literally, or propaganda. Like it's in so much of our media mm-hmm. that I'm just like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my God, this is this is everywhere. Like mm-hmm. I, I never even recognize it. And that's the, that, that's all it is. It's just recognizing how terrifying it is that it's literally part of our lives constantly and how much effort is taken to brainwash us. Mm-hmm. I do want to say- just real quick um yeah. i did see a trailer for a new movie that is being produced i believe by dj abrams and glenn powell and it's called the blue angels i think and it's basically like oh. I, from what i gathered a group in the navy and i'm watching this trailer and i'm like so we're doing propaganda films this of is course. a full military propaganda film, like u.s navy fighter planes. is it gonna be on netflix i think i know what you're talking about is it 
going to be on Netflix eventually. I don't know if it's going to be on Netflix. I think it's going to be in theaters. But when I was looking at the trailer, I was like, you're showing us these pretty blue and yellow planes to convince Mm -hmm. people to see, like, what's so cool about joining the army. I'm looking looking at this like, I mean, it's it's propaganda. Like, I might sound crazy if I say this, but, like, I'm looking at it. I th- like, it, like I, I think I'm not sure. Are you also a Marvel fan? Like, I like, am I, a Marvel I, fan, and I'm yeah, not gonna lie. Yeah, because I used lie, to make like... Marvel content. Like Marvel is so much <laughs> military yeah. propaganda. It's crazy. <laughs> like Captain Marvel was literally an ad for the Air Force. Oh, hundred percent. So yeah. was Captain America, and I loved Captain America. But like, what yeah. was that? That was just a sign up for the military. Like. Also, the trailer, I was watching um, it, and I was like, is this a tr- movie trailer, or is this, like, an army recruitment ad? Because it looks like both. And it was essentially both. And the army has done this before, where they have, like, their recruitment videos edited, like, Marvel trailers. And it's mm-hmm. it's very well, yeah, because Do you remember the Miss Marvel campaign? Whenever I first Miss Marvel first came out, the first one, um, it was an association with the army reserve. Mm-hmm. They did deal with her. Yeah. So like, yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that they did that again. Yes. Um, <laughs> so funny. Yeah. Okay. It's so funny. Anyway, just, you know. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm very upset that Amy Schumer is. <laughs> she should not have a platform in general. She's not talented in general. Like it, it's been so well known that she steals jokes. Mm-hmm. Like and she's not. Even when, like, her humor also is, I feel like it's very degrading for women. <laughs> like, I'm just like, what? we don't want to be known. It's very pick-me culture, in my opinion. Yeah. And and then on top of this, she's, like, racist and xenophobic and kind of homophobic, too, mm-hmm. at the same time. So I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand why we continue to let her have so many projects, and it's unfair. I have no idea, but um, we have, I feel like we've taken up a lot of the time for Media Mania. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> talking about Amy Schumer. So we're just mm-hmm. gonna jump right into the topic of the podcast, which is Two B's newest show, Big Mood. It stars wow. Lydia West and Nicola Coughlin, and it is a very funny show about two best friends. One who is by the name of Maggie, who's played by Nicola Coughlin, who is suffering from bipolar disorder, and there's Eddie, who's played by Lydia West, who is trying to save her dad's old bar. And the show is six episodes long. It's about like a dark comedy series, and it touches on like you know mental health, friendships, and other adulting stuff along the way. And I was so happy that you recommended the show to talk about because I had uh-huh. seen so many ads about it, and I was like. I I have been meaning to watch this and I enjoyed it. Like I really loved oh, it. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy. It's definitely like a heavy show, but I'm glad you enjoyed it because like it handles it with so much comedy, and I really love the female friendship of it all. So mm-hmm. like I think it handled the fact that like being women in your thirties or like about to be thirty and like real life situations because like. It's it's so interesting that Nicola Coughlin's character and that Eddie's character are like dealing with such different things, but such real things mm-hmm. for their age group. And yeah. um, I don't know. I've, I more people need to watch the show. And we talked about the fact that Tubi is like I don't know. It's this like unexpected like streaming service with shows these days, yeah. and like, we're, like no one's watching it, but like because it's free. But like they've been killing it with their shows. I think that like. It's just three new shows that I've seen that I like so far because mm-hmm. mostly other stuff on Tubi is ass. But <laughs> like Big Mood, there's another show um, called Borders. And there's another yeah. one I forget, but it has a lead actress from Rai Lane. But yeah, uh, yeah, what was it called? I, I looked it up. But uh, that, the actor, the other actor is from the show called Extraordinary from Hulu, who, which I really like him from that. So like, I've been meaning to check out more of borders as well as that show too so more to be originals yeah and i'm really glad that like big mood was able to go from like channel four to a free platform like to be that way it's more accessible to people and when we tell people to go watch it there's no excuse for you to not have seen it yeah exactly 
<laughs> exactly. That we need to support Nicole Coughlin right now. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask. Um, Maddie and Eddie are like such good friends, but they're so different because Maddie is someone who's very bright, very intelligent, very spot spontaneous. But be- her, I don't know. If that could also be contributed to like her bipolar disorder, which she is like managing, and which she like halts her medication. It does change her behavior. And then there's Eddie, who's like the someone who's stoic and like very grounded. And it's like a hard worker and she loves Maggie, of course, but you could tell like the relationship that they have really wears on her. So I was just curious, like which one of them out of the two, do you feel like you relate to more? Fortunately, I do wait for to um, um, Nicola Calkins here, Maddie, because okay. um, I've definitely, so I unfortunately have some like, you know, dealt with my own sense of like mental health stuff. And I always do feel like a burden um, I have these upside, these downs. Um, but at the same time, I like get the idea that like you can love like I think that I think that's like the beauty of female friendships, like 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 this unconditional love for what each other is going through, but sometimes not completely understanding it. Mm-hmm. And that's why I really love this show. Cause like even at one point, um, it's Maddie, right? For Nicola Coffin's thing, right? Uh she she's just like oh i'm in a really good place right now she wants to be there for eddie like she wants to be there through her abortion and everything she's going through mm-hmm. but like she can't and like um i don't know there's like a fear of mine like i'm low-key like sometimes scared that like because because i have missed things like a bachelorette party something like that but like i'm like what if my friend really needed me and like i couldn't be there because of my mental health stuff you know yeah. and um so i definitely unfortunately related to her on that sense and i say unfortunately because like I feel like a lot of men's guilt with it, just like she did. And I think they, I think Nicola Coughlin played it so well. The guilt, the love, it's just, it's complicated for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I definitely see where you're going with that because I do think I'm a little bit more like Eddie because mm-hmm. I feel like she possibly has her own mental health issues. And because yeah. they're not as like, I don't want to say overstated, but like, if they're not like as they're if they're not to the same magnitude as maggie's then she has to kind of like put them to the wayside to like take care of her and be there for yeah. her and i know it's like to like have to be the person who's like reliable for other people because they always turn to you for help and like that in itself can be very exhausting and very mm-hmm. mentally draining so mm-hmm. i definitely understand that and i feel like both like nicola coughlin and lydia west do such an amazing job portraying these characters. There, it's really grounded in realism, mm-hmm. and I think I think that's like the heart of the show. It's also very funny. It's it's super funny. And it's very, but like it's it's just actually a really it's a real portrayal of what like women have to go through, especially with female friendships. I feel like sometimes when they show female friendships, it's very catty, and even whenever they came into the like exp- like the storylines with boys. It wasn't even bad. Like she wasn't like I think the whole situation with the guy or the ex that she didn't like, um, it wasn't even about him, you know? It was it was more so about like them and like what they needed from each other. So like I really and you don't find shows like that. Like usually unfortunately they center relationships, they center men, but this really centered what the girl needed. And Eddie like really much she she I really enjoyed the fact that she just needed the guy to like buy the bar. Like that's mm-hmm. all she really about yeah and and this was like the one time where she needed someone else to help her so she needed everyone else to understand it and um because as the reliable character and um everyone letting her down it's just a heartbreak that i feel so terrible for um and i really appreciate the fact that the second half of the show was about that yeah and i think that it's interesting because i feel like a lot of people who watch the show may see like maggie as like a villain inside type of way but i think that a lot of people i mean i think that that's a little ableist you know what i mean because yeah, yeah. Even, even though like it's we know that she went off her meds for her bipolar disorder having to deal with that kind of disorder for like however like most of your life is that something that's easy so of course you want to like gain some freedom and even though like it it has some backlash 
you cannot adjust your comfort level in your life to always being like the solid rock or foundation or being easy to get along with for other people. Because sometimes your mental illness will take such a toll in your life that it inconveniences others in a way that they don't understand. But that's something you kind of have to like reconcile with yourself and just mm -hmm. understand that like you can't change the past, but you have to kind of like remedy whatever future you're going to have with that person really. Yeah, and I, I, so as like someone who has a medical career, which um, I don't want really to talk about, but like something that they don't talk about much and in general, we don't talk about much is the fact that like, even when you're on meds and or in therapy, it's not that simple. Like you can't just mm. be in therapy and you're fine. Right. Like that's not, it's not that one hit solution. And just because you start meds doesn't mean you're fine. Like in general, antidepressants takes like three to six weeks to like actually fit like work antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication and lithium with the dose i thought i found that part so interesting that her lithium dose like sorry spoiler for the show but like her lithium dose not being adequate was a cause of her problems mm -hmm. but something that like we like i had learned in my medical education that that's a big thing like you have to be on the right dosage of your antipsychotic anti-mood disorder medication in order for it to be the most effective and that whole process does take months so like even i think this part was like the most heartbreaking was that like she's like no but i'm on lithium i'm fine what do you mean and the, and, and i figured who that was i think it was like her friend's mother was just like babe like it's very likely that it's not the right dose and it's like you don't hear about that enough everyone just assumes like oh once you're on medication once you're in therapy you're good and i feel like this is the stigma with mental health that like people just don't understand that like the whole process of getting better can take years even right. and it's just not it's just a start so like but like she's trying and her friend's probably been through it the whole time but like but her friend also deserves her own, like, you know, space and understanding. Yes. It's such a complicated situation. And the mm -hmm. show kind of tackle it. I don't know. I just like was like, this is emotional. <laughs> this got me. <laughs> I think that what's interesting about this show is that even though it's funny, it does have a lot of heavy moments. Mm -hmm. And I like that because there have been, there's been an increase in comedies, like, dark comedy centered around mental illness and i'm glad that a lot of them are female led i do find them to like mm -hmm. really interesting and thoughtful and a lot of times they do lend more to like dark comedy or like edgy dark humor within the show to keep the comedic appeal of the show but also sure. introducing like some serious elements and i think the thing i like about the show the most is that there are comedic parts of the show but there are also like those serious moments it's not always too serious too much but i think that the show kind of trains the audience to kind of study maggie and to understand like why she does certain things why she acts the way that she does and to kind of like understand like certain triggers for her and like why she is like like why does she block that guy's number on her friend's phone if they yeah. are like hooking up again like i get it like he's not a great guy obviously we could tell because she kept avoiding him several times and he would not take no for an answer obviously yeah. he is garbage but to block his number and to take like all autonomy from your friend to make that decision and do it for her is not the right thing to do and i know there are like several circumstances in the show where like they both kind of make decisions where i'd be like mm, i wouldn't have done that but you know you do you girl but um, I'm glad that the show really, like, gives some, like, very good groundwork for people to recognize that, like, the mental illness that people talk about a lot, like, depression and anxiety and, like, you know, social anxiety, whatever, oftentimes it's not as clear-cut as you can see it in certain shows, so it's always good to show, like, different aspects of it. Especially, especially something like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, I feel like they're really glamorized in, um, Western media, like they, I really thought it was super cute that they kept breaking up um, A Beautiful Mind, which is the Russell Crowe movie about John, Na like John Nash, I think. I, I can't remember his exact name. But basically, like Maggie was just like, I need to beautiful mind everything. And everyone kind of makes fun of her. But, like Beautiful Mind is basically about like this real life act, like real life person who was a genius who had schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, that's not 
what ends up happening with schizophrenics. And again, unfortunately, with my medical background, I have seen schizophrenics. I've worked with them. Like I've, I've treated them. It's just, it's not that glamorized. And unfortunately, we glamorize mental health in a way that is like sexy almost. And it's like, that's unfortunately not it. Like, um, and I think the show kind of talks about it realistically. Like, like, yeah, of course, someone with mental health who only has a frame of reference of Western media is going to be like, I can do that too. That'll be like, that'll be me. I'll be Russell Crowe. And her being like, and then her recognizing that like, you have these laps of judge, like laps of memory. Um, this is why I gave you that trigger warning because, like, for me, like it hit, like I, it gave me, like it just like it reminded me of so many things that I'm just like, oh, this is actually very real, very like honest looks at bipolar disorder, very honest look at like psychosis with bipolar disorder. Like it's not always like the queen's gambit, you know, of like what it's going to be. Um, this is what it really is looking like. Um, it was weird. another thought that I had. Sorry, I just want to say real quick, like, it's weird how, you're right, oftentimes media glamorizes people with, like, certain mental illnesses that you can't understand, because they either have mm -hmm. to be, like, some kind of, like, genius or mastermind, yeah, or they are a murderer. Exactly. <laughs> That's actually so sadly true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's annoying, because, like, I actually, I think I watched The Beautiful Mind when I was, like, a lot younger, and I mm -hmm. kind of understood what was going on, but I didn't exactly. Another mm -hmm. reason why, like, I don't like those kind of movies, because whenever you take a disabled person and you make them, like, extraordinary, and you make them, like, some kind of, like, feel-good story, it's a way of ignoring the fact that, like, a lot of disabled people live in a world that will not in any way adjust so that they may live a life as able-bodied people do and even though life is hard it is even harder for disabled people because like you can't get married like you can't make a certain amount of money you know most places are not accessible by a wheelchair like a lot of things in the world everyday life it's just like simple for us and then when people see like oh a contraption that helps you like um like clothes mm -hmm. sealed sealed plastic bags or something a contraption that puts on your shoes for you you may think oh well can you not put on your shoes yourself and there's definitely someone out there who would love to have that because they see that as a mobility aid to help them put on their shoes if they have difficulty putting it on themselves so a lot of times they like media i appreciate the the representation that is something that is a little more realistic because i don't need to see someone in a wheelchair like I don't need to see like another boob stronger, you know, the yeah. movie with Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, I don't need another one of those. Like, I would like mm -hmm. a show like Big Mouth or This Way Up, something that shows yeah. you something that's like, not cute. Yeah, and like I feel like disabled people just existing is enough. I don't need them to be special. Like when I say that, when that, it's like I don't need it to be their their disability to be the focus and how they overcame it. Like, let's mm -hmm. just watch the things they exist. Like, this is why I love. Top, sorry. Avatar Last Airbender, but like Toph from Avatar Last Airbender is great because she like is this blind character, but like that's in that's it. Like so, she makes jokes about it. like I don't want to go to the library because books are not my thing, and it's like oh yeah, right, because you can't read. It's right. Fun. Um, sex education is a great job of this too because it's like there's a character who's in a wheelchair and like sometimes the elevator doesn't work and he's just like well that screws me over and that's enough. Um, this idea that like. I get really frustrated because, again, coming from the experience of medicine, that like everyone thinks that like mental health can be treated with medicine. Mm -hmm. These ailments of disability can be treated with medicine. It's like not really. <laughs> no, because like our systems are created not to be for disabled people. So like medicine can only do so much. And even then we fail. We fail a lot. Mm -hmm. So like until we make a better system in society that like accepts people with disability, do we actually like have progress? So like this idea that like, oh, John Nash could like, you know, tell his mind that is like a hallucination is just so annoying to me. And like this idea that like, oh, and when, when the story ends that like they figured out that they have a problem and they got therapy, it's like, no, it's a journey. Like as someone's personally speaking with been in her therapy journey for like over a year now and is still like figuring things out like it is not it's not gonna happen that quickly it is a process just like any aspect any ailment so like 
I think a disability representation is like the one part of Hollywood that like is just either glamorized or like a s unfortunately it's it's very much prey to ableist because everyone's just like, oh well they got treatment, then they should be fine. And it's like it that's just the beginning of the story is right. treatment. So unfortunately, um I think this show very much addresses that because like like the idea what I really appreciated about this character these two girls like the whole blocking up the guy i felt like so i low-key like related to that to be honest with you <laughs> i was just like i'm assuming that she knew this guy i'm assuming that she's had a his like i'm assuming that maggie like thought like oh well i know eddie i know how she is with men i have seen it for decades i'm gonna just block him and it's just like there's a history there there was this assumption of a history there was this assumption that Eddie even knew like how Maggie was, and like that's why that first episode I think is br brilliant because it's like we see we see these two girls they go to this like high school that they went to, and you you really don't know what's going on. You see like that one call from her mother being like, "Why are you off your meds?" And at the end of the episode, it's so telling that her best friend is like, "Hey, are you going through a manic episode? Like, I love this for you, but like, I I feel like this energy is manic." And she's like, no, I'm fine. It's just, it's just like it felt like history was there. So like, I felt like so many other choices is very much like rooted in the fact that these girls like know each other, mm -hmm. and like it's so testament to female friendships and like even mental health is like from the assumption that like, oh, well, my friend always does this because of her mental health, and but that necessarily like like is that right? Is that correct? Are we abling? Like, it's just it's such a complicated situation, and I think the show handled it very well. Yeah, I do agree with you. I think that a lot of times when it comes to, like, your mental health and doing things that other people may find, like, um, spontaneous. Um, other, yeah. You know, or... someone who's, yeah, someone who's used to, used to how you act, it's like, oh, no, that's just them. That's just, like, how they are. And uh -huh. it, it is interesting because, like, it's clear that Eddie loves Maggie and they have, like, a very great friendship and you know they have a lot of care for one another but of course that would be hard on eddie um just because of like how complex it can be to have a friendship amidst a lot of mental health issues and i think that nicola coughlin does such an amazing job playing maggie because she's funny and charismatic and like kind of sexy and flirty in the first episode yeah. and the second one and then the third one that's a completely different vibe a completely different yeah. tone and i love that she's able to kind of like master yeah. those two sides of the coin you know she has so much range mm -hmm. and like I'm, I'm just so excited for her career like that's why i'm like i don't want her and to be so it's kind of like this she she that actress because like i think we talked about dairy girls mm -hmm. like she just like is such a, not only she's hilarious and has great timing but like she's just so she's able to play like this like manic anxiety girl but she's also man like able to play like the best friend lady whistle down like pining lover in bridgerton but now she's playing this manic character who's like sexy but also like depressed and then like also trying to be a good friend struggling like this girl has so much range. So, like, I'm just so excited to see, like, what she does next. Because she is in our house of an actress. Yeah. And I do enjoy Big Mouth. Sorry, Big Mood. Not Big mm -hmm. Mouth. Yeah. But I like the show so much because as I was, like, kind of reading reviews, a lot of reviews compared it to Fleabag. And I feel like... Ooh, okay. I feel like that's a fine comparison, but yeah. in my sincere opinion, it's more like the show This Way Up, which is also a Channel 4 mm -hmm. show, and yeah. it is created by a Aisling B, who is a, an English comedian, and uh -huh. I feel like her show fits the mold more if you want to compare Big Mood to anything, because one thing about This Way Up is that the show doesn't kind of, it doesn't really shy away from like, the depression and what um Aisling's character is going through also you have Sharon Horgan in the show as well who was in mm -hmm. um 
Bad Sisters on Apple TV, which is an amazing show that I love. Oh, it's a good show. I love yes. that show. <laughs> and she's yeah. also, she plays her sister, and she is such an amazing addition to the cast because I feel yeah. like the two mm-hmm. of them are so hilarious and so smart, and they complement each other very well in terms of like comedians. And mm-hmm. I love both the shows because you have two strong, beautiful women who are playing two, you know, strong personalities. They're dealing with like a tough mental illness. And Aisling beast uh character i believe like survived an attempt on her life and she had just left a facility so she's just trying to re-enter society and she teaches english and she's trying to get back into dating but it's a little strange it's like awkward she doesn't want like mess anything up and i love that show so much because i love seeing women being imperfect but not imperfect on purpose because if you're doing dumb shit on purpose just for like the sake of the plot then you're gonna get on my nerves but like when i see like someone really trying to be better really trying to like change and things just keep going wrong i relate to that so heavily because that's literally my life and seeing that is beautiful and it's a real look at women i think like Mm -hmm. i I think this idea that like we are always perfect or we went through a you know flea bag phase and then we got perfect it's like nah it's it's a transition like we have these like downfalls we have these moments of backsliding so like i think that's the most honest look at women yeah and I feel like with Fleabag, even though it is an absolutely stellar show, and oh, love Fleabag. <laughs> as much as I wish there's a season three, oh. Oh. <laughs> looks like there isn't. Because for some reason, Phoebe Waller-Bridge does not want to come into work and clock in and at least make us a new show yeah, on Amazon, despite the fact that she has an overall deal with I them. Know. But I digress. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think she, I think she very much finished her narrative with season two, which. Season two, if you've seen season two of Fleabag, which why haven't you seen season two of Fleabag already? Mm -hmm. It's heartbreak, but it's beautiful. It's perfect. Truly perfect. So I think I get it. (laughs) Yeah. I think that with Fleabag, it's such an amazing show, but it is centered only on Fleabag and her struggles. (laughs) She truly is like an imperfect woman and you can Mm -hmm. see like all her faults and i do see like maggie's character as an imperfect woman as well the sad thing about fleabag is that she is kind of alone you know she does kind of have to like deal with stuff on her own which is why she's always like craving some kind of like intimacy or attention from someone that way she doesn't have to feel alone all the time and with um maggie's character she's trying to be like the fun spontaneous friend when she doesn't want anyone to know that anything is wrong with her when she needs help she needs assistance and i'm not gonna lie like the first episode i thought was hilarious because yeah how is it that you go to screw your old history teacher and he's not even as hot as you remember and you're still kind of yeah. like i'll do it anyway it's like it. yeah, yeah. Girl. like you can get it i i think like the first episode to the second episode is like on a, perf- a perfect transition like i love studying like perfect pilots mm-hmm. and i would say like big it has it's a perfect pilot because the way the first episode ends i was like wait what like because like it ends with her depressive episode Mm -hmm. um and i was like holy shit it was not that's like not not something that any of us probably saw coming we none of us expected this to be a manic episode we all expected that this was like her flea bag moment essentially um and i would say that i think flea bag came out and during the time that like though mental health was being addressed there was still some stigma with it that like if flea bag had would have been done now there would have been so much more mental health awareness in the show and like i i'm sure phoebe waller will like would have like addressed it as well but like um th- there's clearly like this like understanding that like fleabag is a hurt character she is going through something this is her she's also a hurt person a hurt character she's going through something but so is eddie like it's they're both hurt whether it be mental health or not because women just are hurt in their lifetime and have to take it on. Yeah, I do see what you're saying with that. Um, it is tough to watch at times, just because mm-hmm. I do relate to some of the things that like Maddie went through. And it's hard mm-hmm. because you can tell that Eddie really wants to be there for her. Like, there are times where I can, I get that Eddie's trying to help, but I feel like 
is this really helping because this feels very selfish and like i don't know like throwing her the birthday party i could see like oh yeah that's a that's a friendly thing to do that's a good thing to do but like uh -huh. if your friend is deep in like her depression funk maybe it's best for her to just like stay her ass at home because if she has to like perform and act like she's fine in front of other people then that obviously may like end badly and then she also invites her ex-boyfriend to the bar to try to get them to buy the bar which like i yeah. understand you want to uh -huh. save the business uh -huh. but we can't find another rich guy that you know on facebook like you have to uh -huh. know a lot of people i don't know i just feel like that was that wasn't a very like great thing to do i i i think like it's like it's a like half and half like her i invited her boyfriend was bad 100 percent terrible not a good idea um well her ex-boyfriend her ex-boyfriend sorry yeah. yes ex -boyfriend. it was bad i feel like it kind of reminds me of like my mom for example like whenever i'm going through depressive stuff a spell she's just like you should go outside you should take a walk like i feel like that's like the normative response of when someone who is going through depression is like everyone's like oh do something that makes you happy and it's like they don't really fully get the mm -hmm. mood disorder part of it right so like not not saying that about eddie not understanding it but she was just like but it's your birthday we should like you know we should celebrate you're going to be more depressed if you don't celebrate and like maddie's like no it doesn't matter <laughs> mm -hmm. like it, it, you know like how do you explain that to someone like when you're in a mood disorder your neurotransmitters don't care if it's your birthday like it's going to be up like they're going to be down no matter what they're not going to be more down because of your birthday it's just they're down so like someone else who doesn't deal with that would be like no we're going to be really sad if you don't but like so I feel like it kind of was a very accurate representation of like what people assume about people mm -hmm. and mood disorders, you know? So like, I get it, um, but you know, again, I feel like this show was a really accurate and honest look at mental health in a way that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. And I do think that with Eddie and like with what you were saying, I feel like maybe she does kind of understand that maggie's going through but i don't think she fully comprehends like the scope of it mm -hmm. because just mm -hmm. laying in your bed being sad is something that eddie can also do but she also has enough of a desire to get out of bed and like go about her day mm -hmm. and it's different for when maggie is in one of her moods and because mm -hmm. um eddie doesn't have that same understanding and the feeling that maggie has because she thinks her feeling of when you stay in bed is similar to met eddie's where it's not mm -hmm. something that's debilitating it's just something that's like a choice like you yeah. can get up you can go take a shower it's fine like nothing's keeping you really in bed and because you don't really understand the emotions and like how that impacts her with her mood disorder you can never really fully realize like the scope of what's going on with her and her emotions and how you need to be there to help her and she only see like i don't think i don't want to say she only sees maggie someone who's needy but she doesn't fully see like how much this affects her and it feels like that sometimes when you talk to people but like when you really open up to your friends and you're like and they're like you know talk to your strong friends and your strong friends tell you what they're dealing with and you're like oh well um i mean i would just like go see a movie or go work out because that's what yeah. makes me feel better after i'm sad and then it's kind mm -hmm. of like well that's not something that i use in terms of like comforting and also why mm -hmm. would i go out work out when i feel like shit like what what sense does that make you know what i mean exactly. Oh, completely. I think, like, this is the thing about with mental health. Like, a really great example of this is, like, um, again, not to get too caught up in, like, my education and, like, my observations. But, like, this is, like, a thing that I have, unfortunately, a lot of history and time with. Um, is that, for example, like, people always like to bring, whenever you're depressed, people always bring up, like, oh, there's so many people that have worse situations than you. And it's, like, well, one of the biggest key components of depression is guilt. Like there's already a lot of guilt associated with depression that like when you're in depressed, you feel bad for being depressed. Like you don't think you deserve to be depressed. You're like, I'm already okay. I shouldn't be this feeling this way. So when people are like, well, think about all the other people that are worse off than you. And it's like, you're just contributing to this, like the problem. And people don't understand this. Like I've had this situation with my family um, as someone who's gone through depression, but also as someone who has been on the other side of treating patients with depression. Like, you're not supposed to tell them like you're so good off like that's just makes it worse 
And I think that's like the idea that like, oh, like, what do you mean? Just go work out. Like, mm-hmm. go drink water. Like, you know, like, it's like, it's just, it. it's so easy when you're not actually big D depressed. You know, like, it's so easy when you're not big D. Um, it, it's like depression and then there's depression. There's mania and then there's mania. There's like mood disorder and then there's like a, having a mood. And the show definitely really focuses it. And like, I don't know. I don't think, I think we're getting better with addressing stigma in Western media. And I think the show definitely showed it. But like, yeah, like it's it's a journey for sure because media made it worse for a bit too, like mental health, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I mean, so it's a lack of understanding of mental health in general because there's so much stigma even in the medical field and the psych field with it. But like, we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. I feel like for a while, mental health wasn't used in a very tactful way in other mm-hmm. forms of media. So to yeah. see something like Big Mood is really great because I do enjoy watching like dark comedies. Yeah. And I just like the show also because I realized during my research that like um, Nicola Coughlin worked on it with somebody who is a friend of hers, is a uh-huh. friend of her, Camila Whitehead, and I think. Oh that's, wow! Okay. I love that because I think that really yeah. does influence a lot of the writing in the show, and I think that a lot of the acting choices that Nicola makes seem very um, familiar to her, and not anything that's like foreign but very natural. And I think mm-hmm. because it pulls from something that she's experienced, or something she knows and understands, it really does help like alleviate and add to the story more. But I do wish that they did include um, Eddie's ex boyfriend in the plot because why yeah. is it that we have to keep turning to like male love interest to save the day like I know Eddie keeps saying like oh she's gonna save the bar but like she never really does anything throughout the show to show that she wants to save the bar and I know the epi- the, the season's like six episodes I know that um, Maggie's character takes up a lot of her time but I never see any like real effort that she puts in towards this business which always makes me feel like very it makes you feel weird. Yeah, I feel like the, yeah, the boyfriend I think was like a cheap ploy, in my opinion. Because I, I and I get that there's like a heaviness with the conversation with like um female reproductive rights. That's not even the issue. But like I think the introduction of the boyfriend for her just to have that spot line was like a cheap way to like show that, like the trauma that women go through. And it's like women go through other trauma though. You know, like, it, it just doesn't have to necessarily be because of an ex. And the idea that, like, oh, it's just because of men because she had, like, a stressful situation. Like, she already had the stressful situation. It was to keep the bar afloat. Why did the man also need to add more stress to it? Like, I don't know. I I really felt like that was unnecessary. It also felt really, like, out of place, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, what if, What fell out of place again? The boy, like the boyfriend, the ex-boyfriend, like he came in like episode three, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, No, was it? Yeah, it was episode three. Yeah, he came in episode three, and like he was like a two-episode arc. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think that out of all the people that were on the show, I think Sally Phillips was one of my favorite additions because she's very funny. Yeah, I think she's a wonderful addition. Uh huh. Um. I also really like the side char- side characters. Like I liked her brother. Um, I think like I think they could have even leaned into that more. Like I think they like kind of um, like the side friends that were in like even the dinner party in episode three. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I feel like they could have leaned into it. Like they were always just used as a joke. But I'm like, these are great. I love them. They could have kind of just continued. Um, Sally Phillips was great as mom. The brother was great, and like. There's a lot there already established from episode one, so or two even. Yeah, that is true. Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> no, let me bring it back. Bring it back. Um, but you are right. There was a lot established in episode one and two, and that's another thing that I love about the show. It doesn't waste any time telling the story because mm-hmm. you can't waste any time. You have six episodes. You have mm-hmm. to tell your story. But yeah. six episodes in 30 minutes, it is a pretty quick watch. Like you told me when we were first discussing this, like it is 
around like two hour it's around a two hour watch but mm-hmm. overall you get so much of their story and like getting to know the two of them and how they spend time together and how they know each other and i feel like this show is such a beautiful little like black comedy gem that i really mm-hmm. want like more people to watch i think it's really yeah. stellar yeah i hope so too because i do think like i'm not sure if it gets if it's signed on for a season two yet or not but like i really hope it does have a season two because like um we don't have many like we we have shows about female friendships but nothing this complicated we don't have things that are so earnest about mental health and like in general it was just so funny with they were like dark comedy and i just want to see the side characters more i just mm-hmm. thought they were really fun too yeah and i think that the show does like we said before a really wonderful job of portraying um maggie's mental illness and at the end of the show like the last episode it was definitely an interesting one because i think that the show does another job good job of like debunking a myth that people have in regards to like schizophrenia mm-hmm. and hallucinations and like mm-hmm. what is mental illness like it's not something that could be like easily defined in like a dictionary because it'll be different from each person and just yeah. kind of watching and examining what's going on with maggie is so great because if there's one thing i love it is a visual <laughs> story and like i love it i love show don't tell you know, I love it yeah, when you as exactly. the audience, we are experiencing what the like um, main protagonist is experiencing at the same time. That way we're in the story too. And I feel like the only thing I've watched that's similar to that is, um, I think The Father is the name of the film. It stars Anthony Hopkins and Olivia Coleman. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 With, with dementia? Yes. It's a movie where mm-hmm. Anthony Hopkins plays a man who has um, like Alzheimer's, dementia, and yeah. as you watch the film, you get you start to get confused because as he starts losing his faculties and like start losing, yeah. he starts losing focus, so do we as the audience experience it alongside yeah, yeah. with him. Uh-huh. That way we can like understand it. And I feel like that's a beautiful thing. It's a really like <laughs> it pulls on the heartstrings. It's very tough to watch, but it's a beautiful mm-hmm. thing to be able to accurately portray in cinema so that people can like experience a different perspective they usually don't and understand it and then you know you can apply it to your own life which i find is like so beautiful about cinema Mm -hmm. well that's like the point of these stories is to show not tell like this is why like i love avatar the last airbender like i nothing wrong with exposition but it's just like there's a time and place for it and like it's better whenever you let the audience you give the audience credit that they can put it together. You know, like they can they can figure it out. There's the nuance we are capable of understanding. So um, those stories always stick out for that reason. Yeah. And mm-hmm. do you think that Eddie was right to leave Maggie in the end? You know what I mean? Like, it's just so complicated, right? Like, I get it. I get it. I get it. I feel for her. And this is what I kind of low-key love. About, like, we talked about this with the whole, like, Tubi is, like, been centering, like, British international television. I really appreciate that about, like, international television and, like, British TV is that, like, they understand complication. They understand nuance. They understand that females may not, neither can be wrong. No one has to be a villain. Maybe they're both misunderstood and they will eventually figure it out. And, like, I think she was fine for leaving her, but my heart aches for it, the fact that she left, you know? Yeah, I do agree with you on that. Um, I feel like it is a bit complicated with what happened with, like, Eddie and Maggie, but I feel like Eddie was in the right just because yeah. what she had to deal with is something that's so difficult, and, like, it's such a challenge. Like, it's not, that's not something you do on your own. So, of course, she expects Maggie to be there. And I've also been the person where, like, I will fall asleep randomly and I'll forget that I have, like, somewhere to go, I have something to do. I will, like, plan a Saturday and then forget I was supposed to be somewhere for, like, the whole day. Like, I will be that person who forgets things. So I sympathize with Maggie in that moment. But it's, you know, it's tough because of what she's dealing with. Like, the both the right but they're also both the wrong you know what i mean like they're both like okay with their actions like 
Maggie's clearly her lithium is not correct. Her mood, like her, she's not handling her mood disorder, and it is her responsibility to handle her mood disorder. But at the same time, she has a mood disorder, and Eddie's allowed to be fed up about it, and Eddie's allowed to be mad about it. Like they're both allowed, and I think that's like the truest form of female friendships. I think this idea that like they have to be women can only be friends with each other when it's perfect and they understand mm-hmm. each other is like yes like no women are supposed to be friends with each other through the problems and mm-hmm. like both of them do right and wrong at the same time so like yeah and he's right and maggie is wrong but at the same time maggie is also going through something hard so it's like it's just it's the truth this is honesty this is real yeah there's no women technically yeah i do agree with you on that um I do think that a lot of times, especially in media, people expect female relationships to either be like super catty and dysfunctional or to uh-huh. be perfect. Like yes. in complete symb- symbiosis with each other, sympathetic with each other. Mm-hmm. And I like watching Big Mood because you see two women who are both smart, both beautiful, and both mesh very well with one another. You can see why they've been friends for so long. And you see them also disagree and argue and Like, of course, I want Maggie and Eddie to reconcile, but I think that Eddie decided to go after her dream is something that's very beautiful and wonderful and hope that she gets what she, like, really wants. And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie, like, I did like Will. I thought he was, I thought he was cute, you know? He he, he had toxic moments. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he was always just there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Will was. No, wait, wait. Will was a sweet one, right? Yeah. Will was a sweet guy. Oh, I love Will. Yeah. I didn't like the other woman. I didn't yeah. like her toxic one. He was terrifying. Um, mm-hmm. Will was adorable, but like, and I get it. Like Will's right. Like you should get help. Like as someone, as someone who has been on the side of like, I, so I have someone who has been through depression and my friends being fed up with my depression. Mm-hmm. I get it. I get it. Like you know, like. Treat, treat yourself essentially is what they all ask me to do so like i yeah. get it at, at some point you have to stop like looking to other people as like your security blanket and you have to learn how to rely on yourself to take care of what's going on with you because that's the main reason why like i think he's having like these meltdowns and these freakouts and she's yelling at her brother and he's like listen you try to take care of that bar and that bar is making no money. Nobody's coming in. You have one employee, and I don't know why, because there doesn't have to be someone else working there. It only needs to be yeah. you. And you feel the need to like switch up and help it, even though you were going to go to California and be a lawyer, and then dad died, and you felt like you had to do this. You had to fix the bar. You had to like make it better. And then like you feel like you have to help Maggie because she's your friend. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. it's going to happen where like, you have nobody else to take care of you. And I'm glad no one else to take care of. I'm glad that Eddie, you know, realized, like, she needs to be looking out for herself and not be so Mm -hmm. concerned about, like, um, taking care of other people, um, which is great. But I do hope that, like, you know, she has someone who takes care of her because Maggie tries, you know, she does it. She tries. But, like, Eddie does need somebody by her side to help her out as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. Very much. Yeah. And I think that... um, do you think that Nicola could win an award for this performance? I don't know because, like, what's to be's like radar essentially? Because, like, this is the first to be show that I watch. I think we had talked about this, but like, it's the first like to be sponsor show that I've watched. I don't know how British TV works for awards, but like, it's, her performance is great. I'm su- low key surprised that she never won for Dairy Girls, mm-hmm. but um. No, I, I, I think both actresses. I, I'm not familiar with Eddie, but like I, I think both of them could definitely have won awards for this. This was that good of a show. Yeah, and I think that um, it could be like a, the BAFTAs. The BAFTAs are the only <laughs> awards show that I know about in the UK. So I think that there are other ones, but mm-hmm. I would like Nicola to receive some kind of recognition for her work. Yeah. Because one thing that has been, like, very interesting with, like, I guess, like, millennial TV or, like, millennial humor is that a lot of it is centered around, like, oh, my friends are my friends are having kids, my friends are getting married, they have, like, adult jobs that pay them a lot of money, and yeah. it's fun to still have the show where someone is kind of, like, dealing with mental illness 
and also dealing with like <laughs> like you know the typical millennial problems because i feel like this show does a really great job of just kind of like not just laughing about it and like writing it off as a joke when they mention they're depressed but you also just see their depression yeah. and their mm-hmm. like mis- mood disorder and see how it affects mm-hmm. them and see how uh-huh. they have to like adjust and like change their lifestyle around it and still worry about the fact that like i'm not married i don't have a house i don't have kids you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um it's, it's definitely a running theme for sure like i feel like Chinese slate just had like it's coming up with a new movie just about this so um yeah no i baptist would be great if she could get something like a recognition for it for sure mm-hmm. um yeah. she just I, I if not now then in the future i could totally see it for her mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think that um we're gonna see i'm glad that we're continuing to see more shows about mental illness because i actually just thought about one show that i do watch Oh my gosh, not me forgetting the name. But it was on Freeform, and it's not really about mental illness. Hold on. I'm actually going to Google it real quick. Freeform. Oh my gosh. So it's a show. Okay, it's called Single Drunk Female. I remember that. Oh, yeah, the yeah. You, what this other show you were talking about reminded me of it. So, yeah. This Way Up? This Way Up reminded yeah. me of that. Mm-hmm. So you've seen Single Drunk Female? I have. I've seen the pilot episode, but I have not watched more than that, oh. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I do have to tell you, it's a really great show. I think you'd really like it. Really? I know. I really liked it, but I don't know why I didn't keep watching it. Mm-hmm. it. I think it was like overall my television, but I really liked it. And like, I do want to continue watching it again. Yeah. I think it's a very smart show because it's about like, for those who don't know, Single Drug Female is a show that's on Freeform. And it's about this young woman who has to like go sober. She is used to like drinking all the time and having a drinking buddy, but one day she shows up to work drunk and she gets fired. She has to move back home to her small town and she has to kind of rebuild her life. And I love that it takes kind of like the lifetime formula of Christmas movies of like this big shot, like writer in New York City with her fancy job has to like go back to the hometown. But Uh the show is very, very well written and you see like this young woman take like real steps towards her sobriety and how she has to change around her friends and like her exes people who knew her in high school how she has like how dating has changed for her and how you can see like how drinking affects her everyday life and the way like even her mother sees her and i love the show because i don't mind an unflinching look at like how like you know alcoholism or other like mental problems like changes how our lives are um and i really did love single drug female i'm sad that i got canceled but i'm mm-hmm. glad there are three seasons because it was a really solid show yeah yeah i'm glad that there was three seasons too like that's the other thing is like everything gets canceled these days so i'm just like i don't know how to continue but like um three seasons is definitely respectable it sucks when things get canceled because you don't want to invest time and like energy mm-hmm. into a show that you really like if you don't feel yeah. like it's going to be like given a chance mm-hmm. you know yeah exactly which is how i felt about the brother's son because i was oh. really excited for season two and then they're like don't get started yeah they're like uh, psych sorry yeah i i have a lot of feelings about the brother's son <laughs> so i completely understand yeah but um, I think Big Mood is truly like such a hilarious show and shows like Big Mood, This Way Up, Single Drunk Female, Fleabag, Crazy yeah. Girlfriend. I'm glad ah. that we have these shows that are here. And I'm glad that there's Big Mood because, you know, you do have like a black woman as like a co-lead. But mm-hmm. I would like to see shows like this with like black women just as the lead being vulnerable and like opening up or any woman of color really. And mm-hmm. I feel like the only show that like I know off the top of my head is um, May I Destroy You, but that's yeah. not really a comedy. That is yeah. just kind of like. And know, that came out years ago, unfortunately. Like, like 2018, 2019. Yeah. So that's, that's like four years ago. So like, we need to say have something since then for sure. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there are like some series and some movies out there that are like really wonderful, wonderfully written. And I just haven't gotten the chance to see them yet. But I would love the chance to, you know, get into like any kind of like comedy, whether it's a mm-hmm. television show or a movie, but with a more diverse like cast of people. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think one show that like kind of talks about a mental illness, but at least for like young people in Slayverse is um, Heartbreak High. Or at least oh, I yeah. see to like season one. Season two is out. I haven't seen season two yet, but I will watch it pretty soon. Season two definitely didn't talk about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I, I love Heartbreak High. And yeah. yes, it's, it's led by a South Asian woman, so it's a woman of color. Yay. Unfortunately, season two, like, I, I love season two, but it's not like season one. Let's just put it that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's, I'll just say that. I still am, like, excited to give it a chance, and I think that... Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely, definitely watch it. I just... I don't know. I don't, I don't know why shows, like, lose their nerve sometimes, mm-hmm. you know? Sometimes it, that's there are shows that like take the easy way out at certain mm-hmm. times, which I can understand. Yeah. Maybe you don't want to alienate your viewers. You don't want to go too dark yeah. too quickly, but it never mm-hmm. hurts to, you know, kind of really examine like what you're trying to say, what kind of scene you're trying to bring and, you know, really like conceptualize what that would look like on television and just kind of work backward, backwards. Yeah. Cause I think one show that I really love is like Bojack Horseman. Yes, and, you know the mm-hmm. one of the characters, Todd. He's asexual, and yes. one scene that always like got under my skin was when Todd met his girlfriend, his girlfriend's parents, and oh. there's like that title card of like three minutes of a meaningful discussion about asexuality. Mm-hmm. And of all the things that Bojack Horseman has covered, yeah. somehow writing about asexuality is like out of their range, which I refuse to believe because I sat through how many seasons of the show to get to this point yeah. where we could have a meaningful discussion about a sexuality and that is underrepresented it. and then you just kind of take the easy way out. Yeah, that's actually such a real point because, like, I, I so I rewatched Project Horseman very recently. So I do remember that episode. And that episode's heavy. Like, episode heavy, and it says, like, they go into a lot. So they could have gone into the asexuality of it all. Um, Todd is one of my favorite characters that's ever been created of all time. And yet they make him into this, like, joke, which I think is necessary for the representation of asexuality because there's this idea that, like, they can't be fun. They are, like, they can't care. But, like, Todd is one of the most loving, caring characters, I think, that exists in Bojack Horseman, let alone TV. Mm-hmm. Like, the way he cares about everyone, Princess Caroline, even Bojack, even though he treats him terribly, I think is so necessary. Um, but yeah, no, that was definitely a weird vibe for Bojack Horseman, now I think about it, for sure. Yeah, it was. But um, I, and I really do implore everybody to check out Big Mood. Um, did you have any final thoughts about the show? I really hope there's a season two. I'm really worried there won't be. Like, I'm just so worried about everything being canceled. So, like, when it ended, I'm like, oh, why did I invest in the show when I, without knowing? So, I really hope there's a season two. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I do want to say that, like, I did agree with you earlier in the show when you talked about how, like, this show sets up for the perfect pilot. Like, the two episodes Mm -hmm. are so solid. And Mm -hmm. you are absolutely right. And I think that the show does a good job, at least for me. I feel like I, my worldview of bipolar disorder has been expanded by watching this show. And I feel like Mm -hmm. that's what's really important about representation because more likely than not, um, everyday human beings, excuse me, will not go out into the world and just happen to meet somebody who is bipolar or is schizophrenic or deals with any other yeah. kind of like mental disorder um yeah and a lot of times in media that is what people see and they just kind of take it at face value so it's always a breath of fresh air to see a show like big mood come out where it shows you some a real experience that someone has with this disorder and it doesn't hold back doesn't pull any punches but you kind of see like how life can be kind of messy and cringy and even though like Maggie makes some really bad choices in this show. Like, you did not release all those rats 
in that bar girl because there are people here but yeah. i think this show does like a very sincere job of presenting like a real person who isn't just like their mental illness exactly and like i i think this is the first because there's unfortunately so much stigma with disorders like like bipolar and schizophrenia and like I think the showing the messiness of Maddie, like, it's the most realistic look at it because it's not hot. It's not sexy to have manic episodes. It is this messy that, like, this teacher that you thought, this trauma that you had as a childhood, grooming, essentially, that you went through, and now you're making into this hot, like, romance. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, like, it, it's kind of like that level. Like, you're getting your friends involved. Everyone loves it. Um, it's so hypomania. Like, um, the depression is so bad. The depression is a real. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm very happy that this show exists, and this is why I hope it continues for sure. Yeah, and I do hope for the best for Nicola Coughlin because yeah. she is such a lovely actress, especially <laughs> from Dairy Girls. Because I love that show. I miss it so much. And then we were just we were talking about the fact that like. It, it, it just ended too soon like it's just it's such a good show and like yeah i lost the three seasons but like three seasons was six episodes only so like not even eight like what 12 episodes total not that, that's not enough literally like was like i can't come back to sex education because i'm a british yeah, family true. now so i feel like it was probably going to end at season three. I do wish that it didn't. Like, that's one show I wish went... Like, if Dairy Girls could continue on as long as Bob's Burgers did, then I would love it. But it's also centered around, like, oh, a yeah. real conflict that happened in Ireland. So I get it, you know? Yeah. Very understandable. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't going to go on forever, but, like, we were hoping it would. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, guys we can wrap up the show with some recommendations that we will have for our listeners you know like some movies and tv shows that we want to recommend to people and one movie i 100 percent will recommend is abigail uh by the time this episode comes out i don't know if it will still be in theaters but if you could find any way to watch abigail i implore you to go see that movie because i loved it it was so funny it was so scary and honestly it was a spectacular film and if i could go watch it again i would go watch it again because it was just it was honestly that great i really enjoyed it oh wow that's really good to have it's great to hear yeah. um i would say like show wise baby reindeer is definitely worth a watch okay it's hard <laughs> go ahead. hard watch yeah um a lot of trigger warnings mm -hmm. so good so I've, good. Like, it's, like, life-changing good. I've seen people talk about Baby Reindeer, and yeah. I'm interested in starting it for sure, but I am a little hesitant because, like... Yeah. Valid. I've, yeah, I've seen the content warnings. I know generally what the, like, plot is about, so I am a little, um like, what? nervous Did for you it. watch the Quiet On Set documentary? I... No, I haven't watched that, no. Okay. I would say, like, it's similar to those warnings um so the trigger warning i would say is like grooming that's just it. Like, like specifically um it's just really well done though like the actor the vulnerability the messaging the story the heart as creatives i i don't know i just i don't know life-changing for sure definitely like one of those shows i'm like definitely one of the best shows i watched this season this year I don't see them <laughs> this year. But um, uh, yeah, it's a hard watch for sure. Like it's emotional. It's not easy by any means. Okay. I think yeah. I do think that I will check it out because there has been so many things coming out lately that everybody mm -hmm. has been seeing and everyone has been talking about. Therefore, I am just like running into spoilers, like unintentionally left and right. And yeah. I I need to know what's going on. Like, I can't be left out of the conversation. It was just so valid. I think, like, that's why... Is that why... I don't even know why I started being a reindeer for... The, like, I think I was just like, oh... I know why. I was, like, in the... I had just watched Big Mood, so I was just like, oh, it's British television. Let me just watch it. 
so big mood is what inspired me to watch baby Ray too um because i was just like oh it's about mental health whatever and it's about clearly this, this show is definitely not necessarily about mental health but it's very like and the heaviest themes um whenever you're in the right mindset watch it is what i'll say okay i'll yeah. keep that in mind but i think that mm-hmm. it looks like an interesting show and mm. i did not know that that show was like even on netflix until people yeah. started talking about it and yeah. it's the same way where like i have to watch that show i honestly feel like i have to rewatch season one of interview with the vampire because yeah i feel like it's been a while and i still have to watch invincible season two and fallout as well yes so i'm still finishing fallout so i get it <laughs> i i have a lot to catch up on and it's very yeah it's it's funny because i'm like there's so many things that I want to watch and I need to watch. And yet I am in the middle of watching My Hero Academia. And I'm like, I have to finish this because the actual season comes back next week. And uh-huh. I cannot have people spoiling it for me the same way people are spoiling JJK with the manga leaks. Like, I need peace. I need rest. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, you need, you need to prioritize, like what you need to watch like i was re-watching interview with the vampire <sighs> was being spoiled like challengers has been spoiled for me at this point oh, but like yeah. it's like yeah yeah like because people are like crazy like it's kind of like me of um what was it into the spider-verse like people just like recently released the movie online mm-hmm. so like right. yeah so yeah you never know you gotta do what's the smartest for avoiding spoilers yeah that's so true mm-hmm. And that's why I had to go see Challengers like today because yeah, smart. <laughs> opening weekend <laughs> came and went and then everybody decided to spoil the movie. It was like, they were like, yeah. screw you if you haven't seen this movie. Like, I'm telling you exactly what happens. Exactly. And <laughs> like, no one hesitated. Nobody cares. There's no restraint. There's no decorum. There's no mm-hmm. courtesy. It's just like, screw you. You didn't get the chance. Oh, well, that's too bad for yeah, you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That's what happens with like hot topic movies like Challengers or Dune, you know? Oh, I still haven't seen Dune. I still need to oh. watch Dune. Well, if you avoid the spoilers now, you're fine. <laughs> I don't remember the spoilers, if I'm being honest. Cause, Perfect. Like, Perfect. Honestly, there was a time on TikTok where everyone was talking about Dune, and I was like, I can't even be on the app anymore. Like, I can't watch Valid. anything. Valid. 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 <laughs> the only thing anyone's talking about, and I'm like, but just fuck it. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna waste my time with something else, not with TikTok. <laughs> So I do need to get into that. And now that I've watched mm-hmm. Challengers, I can finally engage in discourse. And the only thing I really have to say is that I love that we could be horny on Maine. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. Very I, much. Very much. I need more horny movies. I need more films. Well, and you know the vampire is coming out. Like, yes. too, like that's the one thing. I feel like that's the vibe for sure. So that'll help. We need to embrace... And Bridgerton. And Bridgerton oh. Um... As some yeah we'll talk about that later <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna lie i feel like as a society we need to embrace the banality not banality but like we need to have more fun in movies you know what i mean yeah agreed i'm very much agreed i miss having fun at movies and i feel like talent just brought that back mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and i also think mm-hmm. like i as much as i enjoyed bridgerton season one or at least i tried to I just, I could even finish season two. So I feel like the new season of Bridgerton is something I'm just going to avoid altogether because it was never really my bag. But because oh. people were talking about it and because people were watching it and because I have this podcast, one of my friends was like, oh, let's talk about Bridgerton. And I was like, okay, girl, let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Yeah. You know? Uh huh. Very fat. Understandable. Yes. Um, But there are so many things coming out soon. Um, But Big Mood is something you guys should definitely check out. It is a phenomenal show on Tubi. And I hope you guys really enjoyed the review and us discussing it. And I want to thank Maria for coming back on the pod because Mm -hmm. it was so wonderful having you on. And I'm so happy that I was able to have somebody like as insightful as you. And where can people find you? Um, thank you for having me. Um, you can find me under Maria Watches Everything or Maria Watches Everything on TikTok and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always Maria Watches Everything on everything. 
every platform I mean, and I will be reviewing Bridger's Hands, so expect that content soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Well, yes. thank you once again for coming on. So happy mm -hmm. to have you on. Yeah. Uh, guys, don't forget to check out Maria on all of her links. They'll be down in the description down below. Don't forget to follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and don't forget to tell your friends and family about your new favorite podcast. I've been meaning to watch that. And we will see you guys next week with a new topic and a new guest every single week. Bye-bye.